All right, call this meeting to order of the Ad Hoc Community Center Committee meeting. It is Wednesday, November 9th, 2023. It is 7.04 p.m. Uh, we'll go around the room and introduce ourselves. I'm the chairman of this committee. My name is Patrick O'Reilly. Uh, Todd Souza, Director of Community Services. Amelia Dow, member. Bill Donovan, President of the Library. Uh, Dennis Meehan, member. Gwen Simons, new member. Welcome, thank you. And Liz, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, Liz Stanford, um, resident member. And then we'll have Keith and Darren join us. Yeah, we'll have the consultants join us in a minute. Um, and you have the minutes, the second page, the very, very brief minutes. Um, I'll attempt any motion to approve those minutes from our last meeting. So, so moved. Second? Yep. Okay. All in favor? Yep. And so approval. approval. Unanimous, thank you. Uh, item four on the agenda is public comment. We do have several members of the public here today. Would anybody like to make a comment at this time? Go ahead, go ahead. Just say your name and your address and go ahead. I'm Susan Campbell and I live on Bay Street in Scarborough. And um, I hope that I'm dying, first of all, I'm dying for a pool. I really am. And um, I never thought I'd retire in a town that didn't have a pool, but I did. And um, if I could have tried to finagle a way to get pool into the school, I would have. But um, I don't have that kind of power. Anyway, I am. Um, Interested in what this committee is doing, how much money is being spent at this point, because in light of Tuesday's election, um, I feel like it's time to reassess uh, why are we moving forward at this point, because the school has to be the first priority. And um, also considering that there's been a, a quite a bit of work already done, surveys, the two, you know, the, the very done, the master plan, the, you know. Um, but I'm not sure that whatever this committee does right now can be put on a shelf to be taken out in a year or two when we finally have a school pass. And if it can't be put on a shelf and if it's not going to age well, then perhaps it's time to pause. That's my two cents. Any other members of the public? Okay, seeing none. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Um, I would like to just briefly comment um, and recognize for the uh, entire committee and the public at large that the school uh, consolidation of uh, is it going to be K one two K K three K three K one two three. Uh, did not pass at the at the uh, referendum on Tuesday. Um, I know there had been some uh, conversations amongst this committee about possibly repurposing or using some of the primary school properties as part of our charge and our and our land use um, considerations. So obviously that is off the table. Um, so I, the the charge that we have ahead of us is is very clear, and we need to just continue down the path that we have. Um, been assigned to do by the town council. It's not up to us to modify or change that depending on what happened or didn't happen in that election, um, but just to recognize the fact that we have a, a clear charge to look at this uh, project essentially in a vacuum as to uh, what the options are for us and what we should be considering um, for this project. So that that is our charge and we will continue on on that path. November 28th is just very much. Yes, uh, and the, I guess the school board and the building committee uh, of the, the, the project that did not succeed in the ballots um, will be meeting 11-28, uh, uh, November 28th, um, to regroup and, and reconvene and, and try to decide what, what their next steps are moving forward. But um, irrespective of the actions of that committee, we have our charge and, and our marching orders and We'll just continue on as as well as we have been. Um, uh, as as a member of the public, uh, commented we do have uh, several data points that have been collected over the last two years that are very valuable to us, and it's relevant and pertinent data. And we are going to consider all of those data points as we move forward with our deliberations. So, moving on, item five on the agenda is the uh, UTL section, and we have a first thing is the schedule review, and I'll turn it over to Keith. 
got a call from his daughter. Yeah, he was like calling in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we have a couple members of our team who need to be let into the Zoom meeting. Oh, sorry, so thank frantically you. trying to <laughs> yeah. make sure we're included. Patrick, what was the date of the school meeting? It's November 28th. Sorry about that, Keith. I'm not a very good moderator. Yeah. All right, take it away, Keith. Thank you. Hi, bro. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, um, we, ha we have uh, on our team today from UTL, Brett Benson, principal. Uh, we also have Darren Barr from Ballard King and Mark Mariano from Wesleyan Sampson. Um, uh, we, last time we met with uh, Scott from Ballard King, uh, working uh, alongside uh, Darren on the financial analysis and also community outreach. And we'll be talking with, with them for a big portion of the meeting. Uh, and then M Mark, uh, is uh, new to interacting with the committee, and he is uh, uh, with Weston Samson, who is uh, our landscape designer, but also uh, our aquatics and athletics uh, consultant um, for for the project. And so, we're when we get to that portion, we'll be um, uh, we'll be uh, getting help from them on and their vast uh, knowledge of of the of the uh, athletics and, and uh, aquatics. Um, so here's the brief agenda. We're uh, first. We will try to hold this to an hour and a half. I put some uh, some time limits here. Uh, that's worked for me in the past. So I'm going to be a little more diligent about making sure that we we hold to these. Uh, I know we're all uh, here in the in the evening, and so we'll try to make sure we try to uh, have productive and uh, stimulating discussion, but one that's that's hopefully well focused. Um, uh, we'll get we'll talk about the library. A meeting we have with the library. Uh, pr uh, members of the Board of Trustees at the library, which is very productive. Uh, Ballard and King will talk about the uh, alternative local providers. And then kind of the meat of the agenda is looking at the draft building program and really some of the revised uh, program sheets that we were looking at last time uh, alongside like more granularity in terms of uh, what can be expected for membership models uh, and how how certain sizes contribute to revenue versus upfront cost at a kind of a high level. Uh, and then we're going to talk briefly about um, the site scoring matrix that we've been that we've developed and we're proposing to use. And now would be the time to make sure that everyone's in, in agreement on the criteria we're using as we start to look at uh, sites in town uh, and evaluate them. And so this would be the opportunity to, to say uh, these are these seem like the appropriate spread, or certain these are certain are uh, are more or less important, or there are categories that are are missing generally. Um, here we are on the uh, on the uh, 9th of November, heading towards deliverable one, which is really a summer, summing, summarizing the work we've been doing and the meetings we've been having at this point. Um, and we're really building towards the site analysis and then also this uh, uh, this community charrette uh, meeting that we're having on uh, December 7th. Uh, and and we're going to spend a, a portion of the 1120 meeting talking about um, the questions that we're going to bring and the topics and how we're planning on on conducting that and that should be a great uh, opportunity to uh really be the first uh, activity session with members of the community and and uh, and get them engaged uh, in in the uh, as we're developing the program and the activities that we that we expect um, can i just give them a quick update on the seventh please yep we're talking about scheduling so um we talked two meetings ago about us hosting a well, one we had in the previous schedule, we had a, a big community forum that we pushed off until after the new year. So that'll get scheduled. You guys will confirm which day that happens in January. Um, but then we had talked about at the community center doing an activity charrette. And the goal was to allow people to come in to um, uh, advise us on what activities they would like to see happen in a building. That way, when they get to design size and space and scope, when they get to that point, they'll know what that means. Um, and then how to be able to match. There's nothing worse than opening a building and then can't, it's not capable of functioning the way people want to see it. Um, so we have on the schedule right now between 11 and 1 on that day, uh, UTL and community center staff will go to the middle school and high school. We'll be tabling it during their lunch periods to find out from those age groups what those kids are looking for in a building. Um, we're hosting on the 7th at 2 o'clock at our building um, a uh, active adult gingerbread making senior event. And so we'll be uh, having a uh, 
kind of doing the same gathering from two to three thirty on that day, and that'll be open to the public. But we'll have a target group of like forty seniors there, um, and then we'll open up our facility five to seven on that night for people to drop in at any time and answer the same question. So uh, we're going to really start pushing that out to folks. And again, the key is to find out what people want in the building. You know, we've learned what spaces people want based on the surveys or the program, if you will. It's really now finding out what you want to have happen in there. So uh, people understand what they're talking about when they say how a pool functions or what a rec pool does. Or So and that's our next meeting, right? Because of Thanksgiving. We weeks. meet the 20th. The 20th so November 20th, yeah. we voted to move that that's, meeting okay. to Monday. That's right. And then the 7th would be the next The next event would be a 5th on that and day. The so. 20th will be in this room. Correct. So that's a good question about those demographics. Yeah. So we have the active adults and we have the kids. Yeah. What about that mid? Those of us whose kids are through the school, but we're not active adults. So that's yet. kind of that 5 to 7 p.m. time frame. Yeah. But how are we attracting those people? So, so how that's, they be aware of Yeah. It? So we're going to make a Facebook event. We're going to put it in the town newsletter. Okay. Yeah. So all that stuff will happen next week. Okay. Yep. And then, is sorry. it possible to get a copy of these slides yep. um, and if, if, if future meetings, if we can have them in advance, it's just maybe easier to see. Sure. Is that possible, Keith? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, they'll, they'll probably be a draft form, you know, tend, tend to make tweaks until the end, but yeah, should be. Sorry, Karen. Yeah, so my question was at these community forums that you're having, who's going to be there representing like the committees? Are committee veterans going to be there? Is it your staff? Like who's having the conversation? It should be everybody. And that, that what we briefly talked about was in lieu of our meeting that night, it was already a scheduled meeting tonight for us, looking at that date to be able to be there. Yeah, was the thought when we discussed it at our. Yeah, oh, no, sorry. The two. No, no, we're going to the school on the 7th. The 20th is our next meeting here. The 20th is, so going to the school would be um, anybody from this group can join us. I've just committed my staff and UTL to go to the schools. And 12 7. Oh, the kids. The kids. Yeah. Kids. And then we'll do but, five to seven. Do yeah, anybody seven. can over. You can do one yeah. eleven to yeah. one. You can do two to three. You can do five to seven. Um, my staff and Utila committed to do all three. Is there one that's more helpful than another for us to be at I, that day? I, I guess we could have that discussion on what people think. This can is, I this interject is... one, yeah, one ahead, thing? Go. When we engage with kids, the fewer adults there are around, the uh, better the responses we get. Uh, okay. When there are more adults, they tend to answer in the way that they expect the adults want them to answer. So, so yeah, I, I think I was more like the 55 plus. I, I think that would be a great thing. The like, two o'clock. So, to sit in yeah. on and two to five to eight yeah. Okay, I'll be there. At yeah, two. Well, I'll, again, I'll get all the Get no, the are we go. meeting after the five to seven? After as a committee? I think that was part of the discussion I wanted, tonight. I'm going to try to pop it on the schedule. Or we're talking about later. Just, yeah. I was just trying to get it on mine. So I'm like, I don't think I had all those on here. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure I got yeah, it. I haven't, I haven't worked about that day. Yeah. Like four, four, seven. Four That's your cost. Yeah. Yeah, seven. you can't do it. I have to do it. I could do it too. Or well, we could just, so people that could go, could go. And then we could just have our, our wrap up. And what did we learn today? A little bit without having formal, if we wanted to, at seven. That day. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Keith. Thanks. Okay. Great. And you know what well, we can dig into a lot of these and, and more specificity on on the twentieth. So that'd be that'd be great. Um, and then you know we'll we'll try to wrap everything up uh, at, at our last meeting of the year uh, with that you know try to put a, a, a pin and some finer points on the community feedback. Uh, and we, we expect to really be looking at some site test fits uh, by that point. Uh, and then I think at some point we'll need to uh, the committee will need to establish uh, meetings for the new year, uh, a cadence for that. So we had an opportunity to, uh, Bill Donovan helped uh, coordinate a meeting with uh, Chip Schrader, the library director, and Susan Powell, the vice president of the board of trustees, uh, last week, um, just to talk through, you know, we, we know that the, the library looms large in the town. They're doing a lot of the programming that they expect might move over to the community center. Uh, they have lessons learned from both their process, uh, their design process, uh, and, and their, the surveys that they've done, uh, and, and their uh, they have a lot of good knowledge there. So it was a really productive discussion. We talked for an hour. Um, uh, Todd helped facilitate that, and we had uh, Brett as well. Um, and in in general, 
I think the the big takeaway is that any people go to the library because it's a accessible, uh, safe, and um, it, it it's perceived as a process, uh, accessible and uh, and and free place that's got uh, confidence and privacy and feels like a, a good place to be that's open to everyone. And for some of the spaces that they expect might uh, go to the community center, um, we really would need to reflect a lot of those similar values and approaches. So they said, you know, some of the some of the, the groups that come there, there might be small meetings that happen in their meeting rooms with with social workers or new mainers. Um, that for that those to be really successful, um, they they would have to have uh, feel similarly welcomed in the community center, which I think is consistent with some things that we've been talking about. But then there's also um, location within the building or proximity to you know the lobby or reception. Uh, I think it starts it starts to ask some questions about that. Um, you know their mandate is primarily programs related to a traditional literacy, cultural literacy, and digital literacy. Um, and some auxiliary programs, they also do, uh, they administer um, adult ed and some family oriented programming. And so you know, those programs would stay. And so, you know, they are probably gonna be looking at, um, you, you know, they're, they're trying to chart a path forward for expanding their spaces in the future and being a little more targeted for the, the types of activities that are in their program and kind of in their mandate. And the community center, uh, you know, we have the opportunity to understand you know where where they see some of the missing program and developing that and as part of our our program and but there's a complementary relationship because the there's larger spaces or meeting spaces that the library would probably staff or have events in and so you know they're they're a good partner in town in terms of cross programming between the the two places um they uh, they included a lot of meeting rooms and and a large performance space, a team room uh, in in their recent proposal. Um, and and some of those we you know as you can see we have overlap in what we've initially been uh, considering for the community center. Um, and then some some ideas about what would stay at, at SPL. You know STEM and STEAM programs, book clubs, um, senior tax you know, board games, senior tax prep. But you know ESL social service meetings. Emergency preparedness, uh, crafting certainly the homeowners meetings, you know, really uh, work from people who are having meetings from work from home. Really, anything that doesn't relate directly to their their goal of of literacy in all its forms really um, may ha have a better home in in the community and uh, community building. Um, and in general, they want to underline that you know community the meeting space is really in short supply. Um, they have a couple of meeting rooms, and they're just booked all the time. And a lot of times, it's not uh, information and library specific. And so uh, that that's one one space. And then uh, there are some other space around town. We talked about how the hub uh, is not open on the weekends, and there's limited availability in the evening. There's also the uh, conference room at the public safety building, but that is that will be their command center if there's an event. Uh, and so it, it, some of these spaces are also not because they're not open in the same hours. They don't they're not perceived as uh, as available, and in in some senses they might not be available. So really, it was having meeting spaces where the uh, ambiance uh, fits kind of the programming. So um, you know, welcoming and uh, not overwhelming uh, in order to be used by kind of the same constituents, as I said. And the other kind of big piece, or I guess there's two other pieces, the, the other large piece of program was uh, the performance space. We talked a little bit how they're, the the stage and you know tiered seating, et cetera, and AV in, in the community center uh, maybe de-emphasized, but you know, they're struggling with having any kind of public performance and, and they're basically say that they there's no real public performance space in Scarborough because the school's uh main technical theater um is not nearly is not very accessible because it's being used a lot by the school but also um it, it's on the school campus which has security um protocols uh and concerns uh and so it's it's not quite open and uh open to the public in the same way uh, for limited events more so um and so th they they would like to put on music performances and arts exhibits and and major live stream events like poetry readings, et cetera, by or or author readings. And a lot of these, you know, have an opportunity to charge admission to. Um, and so right that that uh, is a conversation we can have when we're talking about some of the um, revenue generating um, portions of this. Um, and they're, you know, they're turning people away. They can really only do small music uh, performances. And, you know, they would love to partner with the community center for like the, some of these big events. 
and then just reiterating that at, at 315, the library is very busy after school with teens. And you know, some are using it for group projects, but a lot are just kind of letting off steam. Uh, and so it seems like, uh, you know, uh, cleaving the the teen activities towards you know some uh, study and board games and computer games uh, it, that happens in the library versus um, you know more like a, a game room or or uh, like we talked about multi generational game room with foosball and ping pong and pool and the, those are the types of things that you know, obviously are not suitable for a, a library but nevertheless satisfy a, a need in the afternoon for uh, for the teens in town. So it it was a really great uh, discussion. Um, and happy to expand on on any of these. Uh, and thank you, Bill, for for organizing it. Um, I thought it gave a lot more uh, character to um, finding out about the town. Happy to go on unless anyone has any any comments. That was a great summary uh, of our of our meeting, and uh, uh, it's very clear that the community services department and the library have started to go in the same direction. Community service is no longer a rec department. Uh, the library is no longer uh, stacks of books. Uh, uh, and they're much more community oriented in terms of the draw that each represents. Uh, the library was built in 1989 uh, and the population since that time has nearly tripled. Uh, so uh, we are swamped with uh, demand. So a community center is going to make a huge contribution uh, to the town of Scarborough, uh, enormous contribution. Uh, I think the uh, description that you heard of how we distinguish our space, because a lot of our programs, we kind of own them, we manage them. Uh, and but others are run by completely separately by others, and, and that kind of program uh, would be just as suitable. Our in other words, our people don't travel; aren't going to be traveling around. Uh, that's not uh, a very likely because we don't have a huge staff. So uh, being able to maintain uh, the functions of the library requires the staff to generally be there. Uh, and so uh, finding that right mix of uh, kind of library activities that we run that require oversight by the library staff versus things that uh, can operate independently will naturally resolve itself. It, it will become very clear. Uh, is there a need for more uh, of this kind of public space, absolutely, uh, because uh, the library is uh, is swamped. And thank you for setting that up. It was uh, our our people, our new uh, director, Trip Schrader. Uh, he very much appreciated it. It was a very good meeting. It was very informative. And the one takeaway for me that I've shared with multiple people since then is the fact that the library keeps basketballs behind the front desk to hand out for people to go across the street and play yes. the course because the kids are just pent up in the library wanting something else to do. It's just <laughs> yeah. a testament to me to the fact that we need more available right. for that for that population in the town to be able to serve Absolutely. their needs. I think it'll be really important when we go forward to the next step of site is recognizing that one of the challenges the library faced was how much they wanted to add. And people in town were worried about if that was a library function or not. Well, some of these things might have the community center, but the community center is not near, you know, if it ends in a different location, some of these things will still happen at the library because they won't have accessibility to get to said community center, such as basketballs or whatever. Right. And I think, so there could be some real long-term synergy between if we can go forward with either project and what functionality goes on in those where the size of the library might look a lot different now than I originally proposed if we had this based on the proximity of the site selection, where we end up and how it plays into the, the school campus. There's no way around that. I mean, right. my, my seventh and fifth grade kids, if they have to wait for us, if they're not practice, that's where they go. They walk towards the library, yeah. they go get a bath, my son sits around, my daughter meets their friends, and we get them after. And that's just yeah. what it is. 
because they don't have aftercare for that. Yeah, I think I think we have to significantly weigh the right. feedback we've gotten from the library and the testimony of the library people to the to the site selection and the proximity to the schools. I, I think it, it's it's going to weigh heavily in our site selection process. So they, there's a lot of overlap we've learned from the, that, their assessment, what you guys learned. I think it's really important as we go forward to think about how these things will play into each other in the future versus previous efforts. Yeah. That makes sense because they look totally different. Correct. I agree. Thank you, Keith. Great. Very good. Okay, so moving into some of the programming for the community center, I'm actually going to hand this over and we'll probably tag team a little bit to, to Darren to lead the charge on talking about alternative local providers and some some comps for uh, for some of the athletic program. Hey, hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, inviting me to participate virtually. I'm sorry we're not there. Um, part of our role, in addition to looking at the demographics and the participation information that Scott looked at last, last time and, and shared with you guys, is really starting to talk about who the alternative providers are in the Scarsdale area. And that means both in Scarsdale and around Scarsdale. So we well, want to hit on kind of. Scarborough. Oh, I'm sorry, well, Scarborough. Well, Scarborough. Oh. Scarborough, Maine. It's all right. It happens I all had the time. my brain going with Scarsdale, New York. Sorry, I apologize. You can see how I made the air. Anyways, Scarborough, I apologize. Now I lost my train of thought. Anyways, part of what we're going ahead and doing is we want to understand what's there and, and what's not there. Um, so we went ahead and we sort of broke things into uh, talking about fitness providers, as that could be a potential component. Um, indoor synthetic turf and then pools, uh, which is a, a big topic of discussion. So um, obviously we have a couple fitness centers that are right there in Scarsboro to your northeast uh, in South Portland. There's a whole bunch right as you go ahead and as you cross the Scarborough uh, border and then just the, the snap fitness is towards Old Orchard. Um, it's important to note that's not necessarily a comprehensive list when we started doing some searches for things like yoga studios and Pilates, and there were some of those as well. Um, the, the real big takeaway when you go ahead and talk about that is when you look at the fitness centers, the Orange Theory, the Snap Fitness, those are singular focus entities, right? They go ahead and they have weights, they have cardio, they may have some group exercise, it's not typically a place where you're going to go ahead and take younger children. Um, so there is some differentiators when you start looking at what that market is. When we started looking at indoor synthetic turf. Um, obviously, we, we found these three facilities with the Gorham Sports Center, uh, Portland, Main, Portland Sports Complex, and then the Maine Athletic Complex. Um, indoor turf, I know it's been a topic. I'm not suggesting that you need to go that direction or don't need to go that direction, uh, but there are some providers there. The interesting thing about indoor turf is that you can go ahead and you can vary the size of that to meet your need. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a piece of turf big enough to play a seven on seven soccer game. Um, it can be an irregular shape. Uh, we've seen a lot of folks do a lot of different things. It could be set up to go ahead and accommodate uh, functional fitness and maybe there's some batting cages. So uh, I think that when we look for this, we did look at, you know, who has a full size or close to full size space. So we were at least aware of it. Um, the next page is a, a topic that's always near and dear to my heart as a former swimmer is just going ahead and identifying the other pools that are in the area. Um, obviously some community pools, the YMCA has a presence. One of the things that's important when you go ahead and you start looking at these aquatics facilities is the bulk of them, if not all of them, are that traditional rectilinear shape, right? There are more for lap swimming. You can adjust the water temperature. There's a shallow end. There's a deep end. Um, it goes ahead and it, it doesn't necessarily address the needs of the full swimming spectrum. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we start talking about some of the individual spaces. So... This is the the beginning of a document that we'll you know continually update and add more data to and, and really refine until we feel like we have something you know that that we've all agreed upon uh, and and suits the site and ultimately is something we can turn over by saying this is you know what we think is is feasible and works within the the budgets and op and and uh, operational bu budgets and uh, first costs etc. Um, and this is really the first. Uh, 
chance to kind of distill the conversation that we've been having to try to understand, uh, you know, really what are the the big pieces of program? You know, there's lots of small things that will come along with just having a building such as, you know, MDFs, IDFs, and vestibules, and janitor's closet, et cetera. But in terms of identifying the, the big identifying uh, and, and adding some a description to each of those programs, um, this is really where we see so far, this is a kind of first opportunity to talk about this as it lays out as like kind of the palette of, you know, the 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 wish list program of where we think we're starting um, as we start to add square footages or numbers uh, to uh, to some of these uh, some of these uh, programs. So we talked about, you know, lobby, obviously reception desks. Uh, this is a kind of fixed in, in some, the size, not necessarily fixed, but fixed program. And then in the, gymnasium program and trying to also look at uh, where your know, membership programs might want to want to live um, and, and distill that down. So gymnasium being an indoor athletic space for uh, for all these events. And I think, you know, understanding a little bit, uh, especially when we start to talk to the community, what events and what activities want to happen, you know, is going to really play into what the surface is. Um, certain uh, services are compatible and some are not compatible. Um, there's uh, and and they have different durability levels as we talked about before uh, whether or not this is something that becomes uh, you know primarily athletic or something that um, you know has a lot of community events on the surface and then might ha come with some costs of you know maintenance and protection al along with that uh, walking track oval or meandering I think that it will develop but there was definitely people were compelled by the the meandering uh, approach and I certainly think that is an interesting appro uh, approach especially if maybe the uh, the membership is coupled or decoupled um, uh, from the you know the gym and athletic program uh, cardio and free weights um, a fitness studio uh, that will be flexible we talked about you know whether or not it it could also serve purposes apart from fitness. It seemed like for the moment, we will look at having a more, you know, having the multi-purpose room serve more some of these functions. Um, but again, that that could be revisited. Um, and then in uh, tonight, the big, um, the sports and fitness and, and aquatics are really the bulk of what we want to talk about coming up in, in just a moment. So look at different lap types, lap pool types and secondary pools. And then in the community education, multi-purpose room, you know, modeled after to some degree what was being proposed in the library, where it's a large uh, room that's probably divisible into three smaller rooms. Uh, it seemed like having the AV capacity in each one of these rooms is is pretty important. And I think as we as we further de de uh, develop this, we could talk about whether it's three equal partitions or how big that that singular room is, and whether or not you know we want to uh, devote a little more attention to the the kind of performance end or the the lectern end, uh, depending on how we feel about some of the comments from the the library's uh, issues with the uh, um, the performance space. Um, we talked about meeting rooms do, doing perhaps some double duty with the community services department, um, and and also you know, catering kitchen uh, that could serve the meeting rooms and the, especially the multi-purpose room, but not anything like a teaching kitchen because it seems like the program is pretty well established in Portland. And then at the moment, uh, it got a little bit short shrift in our last discussion, but a multi-generational game room, something uh, that uh, has ability to adjust during the day and kind of flex with the different constituents who are coming in. Maybe it gets more use of a certain type uh, for you know, 55 plus during uh, the, the earlier day hours, but then you know at that 315 time uh, really becomes more of, of a place where, where teens can congregate uh, and child watch, uh, but not a daycare. Um, just not knowing the direction and, uh, and also some of the liability issues around having a daycare. And then so, uh, in terms of support spaces, uh, obviously locker rooms and showers, but you know, we didn't talk about family cabanas or changing rooms, which is becoming uh, kind of more common in, in a, aquatic centers where uh, you know family changing rooms with a, a, a shower and WC, et cetera. Um, and we had an opportunity to talk with Todd and, and his staff about uh, the program of the, the Scarborough Community Services that's currently in the hub and really what they're looking to uh, to staff. We talked about the efficiency of having them on site if they're running most of these programs. And so starting to look at to some you know granularity of, of what they currently have and kind of what's on their list, wish list. You know, apart from the workstations, I think uh, they do a pr tremendous amount of uh, project layout and prep um, for, you know, uh, the stacks of 
t-shirts in their closets. Uh, I mean, if you open it, it might swamp you and, and suffocate you. So folding all of those and unboxing and breaking things down and as a space that's uh, distinct from a meeting room seems uh, pretty important. Um, and so uh, understanding a little operationally how uh, they they conduct their, bus their business of, of running the uh, community service is pretty important. Uh, and and laundry for a lot of those activities and and their own storage, et cetera. Uh, and we can talk a little about the outdoor spaces uh, in a moment. That's one that place that we we kind of had to put a pin in uh, at last at last meeting. But we see opportunities for uh, an outdoor play space, uh, some kind of patio that could be serving for you know outdoor space that's covered uh, in inclement weather, but also could be booked in nice weather for uh, you know. Uh, special events or birthday parties, uh, outdoor court component like pickleball uh, or certainly pick up basketball. And I think it's worth discussing whether or not this is a membership or just free to free open for, for people to walk in uh, opportunity and then, you know, an entry plaza. But again, that's a little contingent on the site, but something we talked, we, I think something that's flexible that maybe could be used for programming is certainly something that would be worth uh, considering as we look more into um, how the building will land on, on these uh, different sites. Um, Keith, if I can just chime in for one second, this is the information that we really want to hone in on this meeting and the next meeting and is going to set us up um, for the future tasks for evaluating the sites and then starting to think of this in a kind of architectural concept, um, really understanding how big of a building we're talking about um, and understanding where some of the levers are that we can push and pull based on the site evaluation that we'll be going into in the next month. Given that you're the experts and you guys have done this multiple times across the country, is there anything kind of either trend wise or historically popular um, that we haven't really considered to be included in this list that we have here? I think that's a perfect segue into the next couple of slides, right, Karen? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Karen. I'm sorry. Real quick, when I'm looking at this slide right now, I'm looking under entry lobby. Um, storage empty, and then under support spaces, storage is empty. And I'm going to make a comment now because my daughter is a cheerleader and they cannot find space anywhere because there's nowhere to store the mats. And so I see those empty and I just, I want to make that point is there are activities that require an extensive amount of storage. And I just, I, I want that to be included that, I mean, currently we have a pretty thriving cheering program that are now practicing at nine o'clock at night in South Portland, which is difficult when you have a 12 year old. And actually some of the girls are 11 and 10. And so I think it's important, but I want to note that, that we do need storage space. Okay. I, I don't think that because the description doesn't have something in it doesn't necessarily mean it's not empty. I think it's just taking into consideration the program well, I, I, storage for the programming that you're going to include in the building. Correct. But certainly, Keith, if you could add, you know, cheer, map, storage as, as, a, as a descriptor in that piece, that would be great. But we talked last week a lot about space for, if it's going to be multifunction, having space for, you know, how do we get in tables and chairs in and out so you can do easy setups and breakdowns and that, I think that's all undefined in some of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah that's a, that, 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 that type it of takes thing. an hour to unload a room. It's, it's, it's too busy. Yeah. 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 You can't yeah. turn I, it over and use it. And then it's it storage for whatever we yeah. might have yeah. as capabilities in the building. When right. something else. And then, then maybe some deep storage at some point, like when it's not tier season, it goes somewhere else and then the, the relevant stuff comes out in the next, you know, thing. Yeah. But that's on site or off site, but. Yeah, you know, I think knowing what the activities are going to be will really help us, you know, for, you know, office space fit outs where there's maybe a functionality that changes like a, a, a large meeting room that will turn into, um, you know, lecture style or seminar or or a bank banquet. You know, we'll often do studies where we understand uh, what the ff &E is and how the chairs and will stack. And so, you know, we'll, we'll do the analysis of of these types of mats when they're folded up, you can get. 40 mats, which is, you know, 1200 square feet of, of coverage, you know, I think understanding, you know, the, the next level of, of exactly the activities will really help um, tweak and understand uh, the size that we're going to need for that storage. Cause you know, there, we can identify the, the amount that, that we should start with. Uh, Cause it, you know, if, if you start to load that mat that day one and it doesn't fit, that's obviously a major problem. Um, when, I appreciate so. the comment, but as a former hold on a second, hold on a second. Sorry, he's hold on a second, Darren. Glenn's been waiting. I'm, I'm going to change the subject a little bit, though. So if he wants to go ahead and make his comment, okay, go ahead, Darren. 
Sorry. I was just going to say that as a former facility operator, I don't think we would let Keith and Brett get away with putting without putting enough storage in there. We always kind of hammer that for a little extra because we know you never have enough. So, it, it, but it's a great comment. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to apologize in advance because I'm new to the committee and the last meeting was on Zoom and we were jumping into the um, the um, all of the building, I guess, um, the util, is that how you say it, util? util. Um, presentation. So I need a little bit of context as a committee member now, um, and maybe it's in the written charge for the committee, but um, do we have a budget? Are we working on a wish list? I feel a little bit um, at a loss as to how how I need to function as a committee member if we're looking at sites, but we don't even have a budget yet. Or we, you know, or are we are we gonna are are we gonna look for a site that's gonna hold everything that we want, but then we end up not having enough money for it? It seems like we're kind of doing things a little bit backwards. So, it, can you give me some? context for how this is supposed to work? Yeah, Take that. so a lot of times in the community center design process, and, and obviously the team we've hired can chime in at any time. A lot of times in this process, um, communities start with certain things that have to happen. Master plans, comp comprehensive plans for the town. We've done those, and there's some data that we received from all of those community surveys, our parks and facilities master plans. So we have a lot of those building blocks that are in those surveys that are online, that, and that's how we got to a lot of these. They were ranking uh, facilities. Pool was number one. Gymnasium was number two. Really, one A and one B, and that's why they're both up there. Was uh, lap pool versus a recreation therapy pool, and, and then um, and then those community spaces. Those were all listed out in the um, survey work, and then the plans we received over the past probably six years of work. And then now the process is um, for this committee. Uh, along with the other things in the charge is to really figure out what the community wants. And that's where you guys are really the vehicles to get out to the community and bring them in. And that's why the activity charrettes are really important to find out. So Karen's point, I didn't, you know, storage is empty there, but once we know we have the activity shred, people say, we need to be the home of charity. We need to be the home of wrestling, whatever that home is. And that becomes a priority in that process then this team can design what storage spaces to make that work. Or, um, you know, uh, using lap pool, for example, I would assume that we'd be the home of the high school swim team if this was ever built. And so I left a message for the athletic department. What would you need? You know what I mean? And so bringing them on board in the next couple of meetings to say, okay, what does that look like? And so this part of the role is there's no acreage designed yet. There's no money allocated yet besides the fee for doing this process. It's really about this intermediate step of what does the community want in a building? They will come back with some high level space and land stuff. And that's when we get to the land part of this later. Um, I think it was a couple of meetings ago when Tom Paul was there, we talked about, and we'll get to it later tonight, but I'll just kind of put it in perspective is that we're gonna look at what we already own what's private and then what do we own that's being used that maybe needs to be right reprioritized so it's you know um and so those are kind of how we were going to look at properties um and i know that once they get this kind of space they can go back and say okay you need a minimum of two to three acres you know to do this type of footprints if you wanted exterior stuff you may need x and as the building gets bigger that means more population coming in that's when all your peripheral stuff, parking, walking past, those things become bigger. And so getting this kind of rough layout will allow them to come back to us and say, okay, you guys really need to bring us places that have three acres, five acres. <clears throat> um, but the next couple steps is really about just a, a broad brush approach without dialing down into okay. cost and build. So, so it's essentially looking at what the community has said they would like to have in this type of facility. Mm -hmm. And then we work towards a possible square footage number and then what type of site would, would it need to accommodate that square footage number. And then we look at land options there. And then we would 
probably look at some type of a budget for a possible facility of that size on that many land on that many acres of land whether it was town owned or had to be purchased or what have you and then then, then there would be a budget number assigned to that and, and the part two that they touched a little bit on some meetings and and again chime in guys on this part is when you guys get into decision making once you get that community feedback and you get into having to make some choices on a schematic right um they're going to provide with you with feedback where okay a lap pool costs a lot to build. It's also high revenue. A recreation pool costs a lot to build. It's even more revenue. A basketball court is cheap to build, medium revenue. So when you're trying to figure out, okay, different than a school and, and a library, there's revenue potential to offset some of these choices that you guys will make months from now. That, that's, that was my question too, yeah. is how, yeah. how we're prioritizing. We're going to so we're dreaming now. We're going yeah. to prioritize yeah. and narrow it down yeah. later. And I don't want to say dreaming because uh, we're going. Not even dreaming. Yeah, because we've got all the data from surveys. Yeah. And then once it, we have these next it, couple of meetings, yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's addressing needs. It's and, addressing. It's addressing what people said they think right. is important. So it's not really. A yeah, and then it'll be up to you guys to kind of shape the best option based on all the data you've collected, and then how do you put a budget together if we ever get to that point of that may be considered for a vote. And then what's the best revenue offset to support that down the road? And that's different than a school or a library. So now um I did try to look today at that 2019 survey that was, was done. Trying, Are we using that? Yeah, so it was the 19 survey that the committee did, and then it was also um, the master plan survey and then okay. stuff. So those two were the ones. Um, the okay. Server, oh, yeah. Good. Thanks. Yeah, website. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It should have been the work on the committee's website. On yeah. And if you, yeah. If you yeah, want yeah, to get down to, and I started to look, and I got a multiple versions of it because uh, Gwen had emailed me. I'm still trying to find the last one, all the data. If you want to populate right down to every response, I should be able to oh, that too. Uh, the one I downloaded today was about 150 pages. Yeah, that's pretty. Yeah. I think most of it's so is is that the only one or is there a second no there that's the big one. that's the nice okay one. that's the big one okay yeah. so it's coffee break reading here. yeah i know i couldn't get through all of it before yeah. the yeah. meeting today yeah. Okay. yeah we were Do both on, we were questions? both on that committee so. okay good good i think you all put that really well i the one thing i'll add or maybe two things one is that it's going to be an iterative process. So we're going to talk about program. Actually, on the very next slide, we're going to talk about revenue potential, and we're going to be looking at operational costs. So all of that, they're intrinsically linked. There's the capital cost side of it. There's the operational cost side of it, and there's a potential revenue generation. And as we look at sites, there are going to be some programs that fit better than others. And we might want to say that you know, one program component might be smaller because there's a particular site that is incredibly important and uh, it, that's the priority versus the flip side. There's a particular uh, program that has to be here and we'll eliminate a number of sites. So we're going to be going back and forth. It's going to be a dialogue as part of this committee. Brett, can I just make one more comment if I could, just because we have a lot yeah. of uh, new guests with us today, citizens. Um, just so we're all speaking the same language. And we talked about this during our feast meeting. When they're saying program, they're talking about building spaces. And when they say activities, that's the stuff that happens. And just so when the public says program, it's, I've always in my mind, programs are what I'm building and designing. So they're talking about a program as square footage and space. So thank you. Okay, okay great. I think that, I think it segues, segues pretty nicely. Um, yeah, so Valor King, myself, uh, we kind of become the little annoying shoulder angel in this process as you guys are going ahead and starting to talk about facility components because we like to talk about it in terms of expenses to operate and revenue potential. So this is, again, it's an average and based on work we've done across the country, but things like an art display case, climbing wall, indoor track, game area, racquetball, gymnasium. Those are low expense options in terms of operation, right? And they've got varying revenue potential with a gymnasium that could be high revenue potential. And a climbing wall sometimes can be medium, sometimes it can be low, but we're using an average. And we start talking about some of the medium spaces, which can be things like meeting or multi-purpose room, a senior activity space, preschool space, gymnastics, indoor playground, aerobics and dance, weight and cardio. But again, what you'll notice 
with those spaces is that all of a sudden we kind of see an uptick in the staffing required, right? And with those, you've got low, medium, and high revenue generators. Then finally, we go ahead and we talk about the things that are expensive to operate. So a competitive 50 meter pool, a drop in childcare, kitchen, theater, uh, conventional 25 yard pool, leisure pool, and then some of them have low revenue potential and then some of them go ahead and go to high. As we go through this process, we'll want to talk in those kinds of terms and even go ahead and start drilling down and assigning some dollar amounts just so we have an idea that when we get to the end of the day, we've built a facility or we've designed a facility um, that not only addresses the needs of the community, but is not going to go ahead and be a financial drain on the on the city. So um, we very much are going to start integrating that type of conversation into the meetings that we're going to have moving forward. Karen, can I just ask a quick question? Absolutely. Um, the expense you just alluded is that that's referring specifically to ongoing expenses as Correct. opposed to original startup. Correct. Correct. This is this is a, an operational slide. So expense to okay. operate versus revenue generation. And it's primarily due to um, employees or. There's employees, uh, when you start talking about things like pools and ice rinks, those are 24 hour a day, seven day a week operations. It can be utility costs. It can be additional costs in terms of um, chemicals, all those kinds of things. So, yes. Thank you. Karen, down yep. the road, we also get into like, okay, we've identified these, but it's also like a pool cost X to build versus a gym cost Y to build type thing versus a climb. Like, is that all? Is that that's, this is operating? That's what is that? What's that called? This is the operational revenue to expense. What's that? That'd the be build? the purse cost or the capital say. cost? Yeah, capital cost. Okay. Yeah. Capital cost. Okay. Yep. That's what I want to pick. So this we're talking, this is operations. Capital is a different slide. Okay. Yes, for sure. So it, in along these lines, I, I'm sharing some data on the next slide, and, and it's not meant to scare you, but these are operational plans that we've worked on in the past 12 months. Um, Kirkland, Washington, we projected they had a, a 90,000 square foot and a 75,000 square foot operation. Uh, or proposal. So their operational budget, just expenses came into that 5.2, 4.8 million range. Bozeman, Montana was about 4.1 million. St. Charles, Missouri, a bigger facility, but was operating more as a field house and absorbed some existing staffing. That was 1.5 million. Uh, Waterloo, Iowa was again, more of a field house, 1.6 million. Brighton, New York was more of a community center that was absorbing existing operation plus expanding. That was 2.3 million. So they are not um, in significant numbers when you start talking about what it costs to operate these types of facilities. Darren, exclusive of CapEx, what, what approximate percentage do you guys see these facilities on an operational perspective only being self-sustaining in terms of revenues, being opposed to equal or what percentage of revenues over expenses? It's a great question. Um, there's a lot of caveats and but this and then if you were just asking for a straight number, probably less than 10 percent. Are self-sufficient, totally self-sufficient? Are totally self-sufficient. Oh, what's the percentage well, of revenue that's offsetting this operational cost? Right. Is it an average of 65, 70% of operation? Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I misunderstood the question. I misunderstood the question. Sorry, um, I probably didn't state it clearly. No, 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 no. So typical cost recovery and kind of looking at where your guys' demographics are, you know, that 75 to 80% cost recovery is usually where you start off at. You might peak yeah. out as high as 90%. Um, some of it is, you know, I'll go back to, you know, 15 years ago when I started doing this, I worked with a client and they went ahead and said at the very beginning, this facility has to be 100% cost recovery. We, we're going to ask the public what they like, but it, the guiding principle, it has to be 100% cost recovery. So that guided every decision that we went ahead and made and put into the facility. If the committee goes ahead and gives us a directive like that, um, it becomes a very different conversation when we start talking about components and sizing and those types of things. 
that's up to cover the operational budget, not only build budget. Correct. So the bond or whatever, that's a totally, yeah. that's, that's sustainable. Right. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so these are annual expenses. These annual, these annual, right. right. Not counting the expense of building. This is and then right. just so you, you know, and, and again, for the, for the committee, you know, that when we put out this RFP for um, hiring a firm in our, in our, in our write-up was, um, one of the factors was designing a facility that was the most cost recovery effective that it could be based on the parameters we set. Because we do know that certain things we're going to choose as a municipality, we're not going to upcharge seniors $20 a little lunch to make full recovery. You know, and so certain things like that where the charge when we hired them was to be able to give us the most cost recovery based on the decisions we make as a community at the end and along the way. So, Will you be able to give us um, some more information about the operational costs in terms of breakdown of um, employee costs versus, I don't know, maintenance costs? Um, you, will have a very, you will have a very detailed budget at the end of this process for the operation that will talk about full-time and part-time staffing. It'll talk about all the commodities, consumables associated with the facility. It will talk about all the contractual obligations to include things like utilities, credit card charges, all those kinds of things. We're even going to go ahead and make a recommendation that the city go ahead and begin allocating X number of dollars to uh, capital investment funds so that they can go ahead and they can, they can make improvements to the facility over time. Um, same thing, you'll have that from the revenue perspective as well is a very detailed line item budget. So you'll know at the end of the process that this is what it's going to cost to build it. This is what it's going to cost to operate it. So you'll have a, a full picture and that all that information will be vetted with the committee and with staff. Um, looking at some spaces in particular, um, we've got uh, Mark from Weston Sampson to to lend his expertise to this too. You know, I think now is the uh, Dara, maybe if you could lead this portion of the discussion, um, kind of talking about um, really where we're trying to go with with this discussion and and where we're trying to get to with the programming. Yeah, so I think it's important for the committee to know that we're not trying to write things in stone tonight and that we're just going ahead and guiding, getting some guidance from you when we go ahead and we start talking about some of these spaces so that it goes ahead and helps gives us a framework uh, when we're going ahead and when we're talking with the public. Um, aquatics is always an interesting one. Uh, being a former competitive swimmer, what my view of an amazing pool looks like is very different compared to my 15 year old who uh, really is good at can cannonballs. So um, I think that's something that we have to go ahead and we have to take into consideration. I think one of the big differentiators when you start talking about public recreation facilities is that they are one of the few places where you can still take your whole family and be there for multiple hours and everybody has a good time at a reasonable cost. So when we start talking about pools, um, there's a lot of different directions that we can go. We can go typical, what I would call rectilinear lap pools. It can be six lanes, eight lanes, 10 lanes, 16 lanes. Uh, you can go ahead and you can go leisure pools, which are typically irregular shapes and can be all variety of sizes. Um, you can go uh, instructional pools, which typically are more rectilinear, but with warmer water and shallow water and not really lap swimmer friendly. Um, you can go therapy pools. There's a lot of different options um, to look at. And there's a most community centers we're working on, recreation centers we're working on right now. Um, they at least start with the idea that there's going to be two separate bodies of water. The next slide goes ahead and talks a little bit about the swimming community. And I know that it sounds like we're focusing a lot on pools. But I can tell you, we, we had a client that said, we're absolutely not going to include a pool in this facility. We did a survey. Number one thing people wanted was a pool. We went ahead and talked about a building without a pool. And I said, you can do this. But the first day you open your big, beautiful, brand new building, the first question you're going to get is, where's the pool? Um, so that's why we talk about it quite a bit. Uh, according to the National Sporting Goods Association, they break out participation in terms of for swimming that about 6.1% of the population are frequent swimmers. They go to your pool more than 110 times a year. Um, they're typically looking for cooler water, deeper water, lap swim water. 
Uh, they're the for former athletes like myself, that, but they differ in that they've kind of stayed in shape and still swim some. Um, you have your occasional participants, which go anywhere from 25 to 109 times a year. You get on the far end of that spectrum, 109 times, nine times a year, they're looking at it from a fitness perspective. Uh, you go ahead and you get to the occasional, the 25 times, they're looking at it from a leisure perspective. So the occasional, we kind of lump into this. They're looking for warmer water. They're looking for multiple depths. They're looking for a fun factor too. Um, maybe not every time, but they're looking for something there and a social factor. Uh, the group will will giggle at this, but uh, I worked at a pool where we had a current channel, Lazy River. And uh, the, the biggest design flaw was that on the island in the middle, we didn't go ahead and we didn't have the, the designer build coffee cups for all the folks that came and walked in the current channel in the morning. So they had a place to put their coffee cup. Um, a little scary. Sometimes you'd see a pill bottle next to the coffee cup. That always made you a little nervous as a lifeguard. Um, and then you have that inf infrequent group that it's about 54% of your swimmers. Um, they're looking for a social experience. They want warm water. They want entertainment. They want a wow factor. Um, that's what they're looking for. But some other things to consider with pools are the most expensive to build. Um, they're the most expensive to operate, uh, but they are one of the highest demand activities and, and amenities because it touches the full age spectrum. You can go to a pool and you can see uh, an infant a couple months old, or you can go ahead and you can see someone who's coming up on the Century Club and, and they're getting their daily laps in or their daily walking in. So um, that's part of the appeal of a facility like that. The next slide just goes ahead and gives you a little bit of a flavor. Um, if you're talking about high school swimming and college swimming, it's all in yards. Uh, then we go ahead and if you get into the Olympic pursuits, it's meters. Um, if you're looking for, if you went in and said, we want to build a pool that can accommodate high school swimming, you need a six lane, 25 yard pool, and that will accommodate the base level competition. Typically it will have diving boards as well, but then you can't do diving practice and swimming practice concurrently without impacting one another. From there, you'll go up to a eight lane, 25 yard by 25 yard pool. Uh, still with diving, you still have some conflicts. Um, my Favorite configuration, you say BK preferable, that should say Darren Barr preferable, is the whole idea of a 25 yard by a 25 meter pool. Gives you a few, few more lap lanes. You can start to go ahead and do diving and swimming concurrently. And then there's also an idea of an eight lane, 25 yard stretch. The two images that are on the bottom, the one on the lower left hand corner, it's an outdoor pool, but it is a tip, it's an eight lane, 25 yard pool. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Um, people always ask me what's an eight lane, 25 yard stretch pool look like. So that's the image on the lower right hand side. It has a movable bulkhead and on the far right where you kind of see some shallow water and some lap lanes going the width of the pool. If you wanted to accommodate diving, that would typically be your deeper end that you could go ahead and you could dive. So that's your traditional rectilinear water. Um, they are doing some things now to try. I mean, you can put inflatables in the water. You can put obstacle courses in the water. There have There's a design now that has a ninja course uh, that goes ahead and lowers down from the ceiling. You push a button, it lowers down. And then you can, the best part about the ninja course is watching people doing that, of course. And you get some great, you get some great uh, crashes for sure. Um, but they're doing things to go ahead and animate bodies of water like this. If you have a competitive swim group going ahead and putting a scoreboard up and all of a sudden you do a dive in movie and everybody's floating around in inner tubes and Jaws is playing on the screen. So um, there's some fun stuff that you can go ahead and do. Maybe Little Mermaid, depending upon your, your clientele, I guess. Um, the next slide talks about uh, some of those other bodies of water. Um, leisure pools are still what I would call... Um, a, a positive trend. Uh, they can vary in square footage, uh, anywhere from a 3,000 square foot uh, body of water to a 7,000 square foot body of water. Um, they can have a variety of amenities. The picture that's in the lower right hand corner is the one that's in the community that I that I live in. Um, has a zero depth entry, a play structure, has a ramp entry down to the deeper area. Deepest point is three and a half, four feet. It has lap lanes integrated into it. It has a current channel slash lazy river, has a water slide. Um, I think one of the things that's important for the committee to hear when you start talking about a leisure pool is that when you walk in and you, you start the pool at 530 in the morning or you open it to the public, you don't have the spray features on. You don't have the water slide on. Really, in the morning time, you're you're dealing with your lap lanes and your, and your current channel. It might be that 
you know, during the school year, the slides only offered on the weekend. So um, I think when people look at those spaces, they're like, oh, it's a fun, it's water park, but it's very functional, multi-use. And just because you have all the features, it's not a it's not a one and done option. You can go ahead and turn stuff on and off throughout the facility. Um, one of the biggest trends that we're seeing in, in some of our aquatic spaces is the picture on the lower left, which is of a swim of a swim school. Um, there's not many communities that we're going into at this point that don't have a demand for swim lessons that exceeds the capacity. Uh, so you're finding these little swim schools pop up all over the place. Typically, it's a three lane, maybe four lane pool. It's only 15 yards long with each lane. You go ahead and you've got a bay on either end so you can accommodate six to eight classes at a time. Um, it, they also tend to get into some group exercise or some therapy um, I did not include a therapy image here, but those can be a variety of different shapes as well. So um, anyways, that's pools 101 as quick as I can do it without going down the rabbit hole. I just point out again, because I don't think it'd be possible as we mentioned earlier, we do have one of those in this time. Swim time. Oh, yeah. We do have it's, it's very youth based. Like you wouldn't dive and jump into it as an adult, but we do have you know, private, small, it's not very big, but my kids took some lessons there. Yeah. It's and it's it is in town. I just it wasn't on the list of other pools. It is youth. I don't know how many adults go. I only really went to it as a kid, but with my kids, but we do have a youth based learning to swim program on a pool together in the Swim time. Indoors. Swim time indoors. It's, at, it's, at the it's built on the town land down Lincoln. They're building a new one in Portland now at the at the um, at Goldfish School. Yeah, it's like this one. Yep. It's, it's like that. Yes. Huh? In Gorham, that's over the line too. So there's two. But for that youth, I'm just saying, for, when we're considering all the pool designs, there is a youth one in town. So if not an adult, I don't think we can do adult laps now. I don't know though. Um, Darren, could I ask your opinion on, um, I talked with Andrew, I forgot his last name. Do you know uh, Andrew at the um, Cape Pool? Yeah, that was um, great. That email you sent out? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, his recommendation was, um, he runs the, the um, Cape Elizabeth Pool here, mm -hmm. um, the closest one, the one that I swim at. His recommendation was um, minimum eight lanes and preferably 10. And then um, you can always, that way you can always um, rope a couple of lanes off when you're having a swim meet, you can still have sure. a couple of lanes open for community members to swim. Or if you want to have an aerobics class in, in that side of the pool, instead of his recommendation was instead of having two separate pools, because number one of the cost and number two, that the temperature um, of a uh, therapeutic pool is really not that much warmer. And if you're exercising in the pool in the first place, um, it may it really can get too hot at the higher temps. Although that's that's a different issue than maybe the therapy pool where maybe sure. they need it to be warm. Um, but I don't know how much um, use, and, and that's what we, I guess, have to do later is figure out if there would be enough use of a, a therapy pool that would warrant the cost. Yep. But do you have an opinion on the on the number of lanes and mm -hmm. one pool versus two considering separating? Sure. If it's big enough, we can separate it off. Um a couple couple pieces of information or a couple sound bites that I would offer the group. Um it's very difficult. While it's very easy to add a gymnasium to a facility, it's very difficult to make a pool bigger once you dig that hole in the ground and pour the cement. So um, if you have an eight lane, 25 yard pool or a 10 lane, 25 yard pool, which is what you would get with that 25 yard by 25 meter configuration, it gives you a fair amount of flexibility. However, here's the trick. If you're going to go ahead and if you're going to accommodate competitive swimming, they're going to want the water temperature at 80 degrees, 81, 82. I tend to like 82 a whole lot more than I used to. If you want to accommodate the public, the non-swimmers, the people that want to come in and play in the pool and want to participate in swim lessons, you're going to put kids in 86 to 88 degree water for swim lessons and their lips are still going to turn blue. Um, so you can only imagine what happens if you put them in 80 or 81 degree water. 
at one point, it was completely acceptable. We went ahead, we built one body of water, everybody dealt with it, and you can make it work. Can it be done? Absolutely. Um, for our planning purposes and for where you're at right now, um, I think it's at least worth discussing the idea of two and what those two look like could go ahead and could vary based on what you feel the need is. Um, Darren, are you? Oh, you guys can hear me. Sorry. <laughs> Continue. Darren, can you hear me? It's Mark. Yep, I can hear you, Mark. Hi. Um, to, to parlay on what you're you're saying, pools nowadays, they are very expensive to build. And to not create multiple programs on every square foot of water does put the community at a disadvantage. Um, and having the two bodies of water essentially does help have um, that competition end and also that warm water. A lot of revenue is going to be generated from that warm water. Um, Love to hear Mark was saying. Oh, I'm. I'm screaming. Sorry. <laughs> um, the uh, to, it, it is. And we should we should focus on if we're looking at the one pool aspect, we probably are catering more towards. Can't hear you, Keith. Can you hear him? I, I we can't make out what he's saying. I can't either. I think what he's what he's pointing at is that you know with from a revenue stream perspective, you're going to, if you're looking at one body of water, whether you looked at it just from a leisure pool or just from a lap pool, you go ahead and you begin to constrict your opportunity. So at least at the beginning, going ahead and looking at it from multiple avenues is great. I, I understand what they're trying to accomplish and saying, if you have 10 lanes, you can have an eight lane, 25 yard uh, competition going on. And then a couple lap lanes allocated for public swim the general lap swimmer is going to walk in and is going to see that competition going on and they're going to turn right around and go back into the back into the locker room and not do their workout that day. I, I, I just watched it happen too often. The other challenge too, with I know we talked about some kind of, we've got some swim lessons ability. The last pool that I managed had had six lanes with a zero entry and it shared the same water temperature and mm -hmm. nobody was ever happy yeah. um that means you had the water temperature right if everyone complains about it it's perfect <laughs> it was the most cost effective we saved a lot of we saved a lot of energy but um <laughs> yeah when we had to cut money we went down a degree and people lost their mind but they didn't want the membership to go up so that was always the debate we had but yeah. um i can say that we ran swim lessons all the time we could have a high school swim meet uh, practice going on and still operate swim lessons we never did it at a competition because pool deck space is being used and other things start factoring into locker room space and you're not going to the high school's not going to allow you to be in that space when they're coming back and forth but more importantly is when you just do a lap pool what is it a minimum of four feet or three feet in the shallow end four four you know think about a toddler that's over their head most of the time and so mm -hmm. that learning environment is really important having that that gradual grade into some section of a pool i mean we used to have babies sitting in floaty diapers sitting in a half inch water and parents socializing playing and water features going on mm -hmm. busy all the time and there's not many of those in Maine and it's, it's huge revenue job so again just just perspective and operations I have a little something to add um can you guys hear me yes go ahead Liz okay um uh, I had dinner in Freeport on Tuesday, so I took an opportunity to go to the Freeport YMCA because uh, they, they do have the two pools, a lap pool, and then really something that's uh, very much like a very basic kind of therapy pool. Definitely not a recreation sort of thing like we have on the bottom right hand picture here. Um, it was about 630 at night. Uh, and the lap pool, uh, was busy with people doing laps. One part of it was, uh, cordoned off and there was, a uh, active adults, uh, and that part doing just sort of some, a little bit of like aqua therapy, maybe not therapy, but just kind of swimming and not really doing lap stuff. Uh, in the smaller pool, um, there was, um, a lot of parents there watching their super small kids in a swim class, um, pretty young, um, pretty young. Uh, and it struck me that 
the swim class couldn't really be over in the lap pool, you know? Uh, it also struck me that the small pool wasn't really much more than swim classes, maybe just therapy. And that I think for us to really make it work and have that massive draw of families. I mean, when my family, my four kids were small, I would have gone to that rec pool uh, down on the bottom there all the time, all the time. Um, so it, it kind of struck me that something just that a therapy pool and a lap pool, not great, but if, but if it can be a recreation slash therapy, if we can design it right, um, you know, it might make a difference. Um, I did ask about the temperatures on the pool. Uh, the lap pool is set to 81 and the smaller uh, swim lesson pool therapy pool is 89. Um, so that's my two cents on, on that. It was interesting to go see it. Thank you. And we'll talk a little bit more when we uh, look at some tour dates for our field trip, uh, looking at the facilities that later on tonight. That stuff. Are any of those things we talked about have anything outside of just a swim lane pool and a uh, warm or small or shallow or pool? Was, like, I don't know if anybody has. I've never seen. We saw the ones, all the slides. All, does anybody have anything like that? This castle, in my previous pool, was the only one, and it wasn't yeah. anything. Wow. It was uh, 25 yards by about 20 feet wide zero entry to four feet. We had a couple spray features, basketball hoop, uh, and then, and then it, it shared the same water. So there was like a cutout in the shallow end. So you, when we did water walking, you could walk through the, the rec pool into the lane four, I mean, uh, six, five, and four, or we would take all the lanes out and they could walk in four feet of water. So again, you had to not only do one activity at a time because you couldn't come across, but that's the only one really in Maine that has any sort of spray features that I know about. Over New Hampshire or yeah, over New Hampshire. Oh, out of state, yes. Yeah. Yeah, just yeah, but yeah. yeah. So your competition if you're talking about revenue bills. Yes. Yeah. Fun town splash town aqua bottle, which you pay thirty, thirty-five dollars yeah. a day to go into. So there's there's of, of all the things I've been thinking about with all the other communities, there are lots of communities with pools around us. Nobody has that or anything to do with that. You know, every um, day during the winter swim lessons and as soon as we closed right from time. noon to eight, there was birthday party rentals. And then whether you had a membership or you were paying a day fee, and that's a whole nother conversation, right. you can start talking about consideration of structure, but people would drive an hour in a circle to come to us because there was nothing else to do in the winter. So it was really, so then it's, it's staff programmability. It was a trash. How do you, how do you share for your members and not lock up Correct. too much? And that, that was the struggle. So. Correct. So. Darren, can you tell us if the modern sense of indoor pools is that a leisure pool is so significantly different from a lap pool that people who are building pools are doing both. They're not trying to have the lap pool function as a leisure pool. The, the modern movement is that yes, you're going ahead and you're doing two separate ones and you're pushing that direction. There are situations that we've encountered where people have said, look, we can only afford one body of water, but we go ahead and it's got six or eight lap lanes and a little channel that goes into a shallow area that maybe has a zero depth entry and a play structure and those kinds of things. So there is some ways to go ahead and to navigate that if push comes to shove. I just want to mention it's 8.22. I know we're we're scheduled to be to 8.30, and there's quite a bit left on the agenda. Are people okay going 15 or 20 minutes over tonight? Like, this is really good conversation and important yeah. stuff to go through. Everybody's okay with that? Okay. All right. Let's pass on. Okay. M moving on to the gymnasium and, and walking track. Um, you know, we – we had some comments about ensuring that track is wide enough, indoor space at total premium, uh, and and durability is pretty important. Uh, I don't know, if Darren, if you want to jump in and and kind of lend some of your expertise on on the what you see in terms of demographics and size, et cetera. I I think the conversation going ahead and at least starting with the idea of two full size courts that are side by side becomes important. I think there, are, if you're looking to potentially host some basketball centric or volleyball centric. 
uh, opportunities. I think you're probably going down the path of a hard court, uh, wood, wood court, if you're going ahead and if you're a little bit more open to it being a true multifunction place or function facility, you may look at a synthetic flooring. Um, obviously this gets you a lot of real estate as it relates to a walking jogging track. Um, but it, you know, heavily used, heavily programmed, um, pickleball, floor hockey, uh, lacrosse practices, so indoor soccer, futsal, you name it, you can do it in that space. So it is a workhorse as it relates to programs and opportunities. Is there a, a cost benefit break even consideration between two or four? Um, it, it, the, the benefit of two versus four really comes into the ability to host tournaments. Um, if you're saying you want to do that, you're going to probably want to start with a conversation of four. Um, obviously it goes ahead and makes your track bigger. Um, the other thing that I will tell you that makes some people cringe is that it is an area that you can go ahead and you can add a gymnasium onto uh, relatively easy or at least plan for in terms of a site analysis. I mean, subsequently. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. We even talked about maybe doing both, right? Two and two. One time synthetic versus. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure Darren can touch on it. Again, it depends on the activity space, but we yeah. had some models that we had shown where there was a, you know, a hard court and the extra court was more of a synthetic, so you still could play recreational level stuff on there, but maybe have a fitness class or throw a baseball or have a lacrosse, have different rental opportunities without having to put a floor cover down to damage your hardwood floor. So that would just come down to the activity base you were trying to accomplish. 100% agree. Okay. One of the things to go ahead and consider, um, you kind of talked earlier about spaces that maybe we weren't going ahead and, and weren't thinking about in, in terms of your, your geographic area. Um, we're seeing more and more folks that experience the long winters talking about the potential for an indoor playground. Um, if that's something that gets engineered out because there's not the resources to build that space, um, gymnasiums gets transformed into an indoor playground or at least one quart of it. Uh, that happens from 11 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Monday through Thursday, and you're able to accommodate that that need using a gymnasium space. That gets back to Karen's need for storage. <laughs> Correct. Thanks, Karen. I don't think you can find enough program space, no matter how big you build. There's, there's the, the groups that aren't identified in the service of the groups that we don't even know about yet because they don't have any. Yeah. space to go to you just you really it's the one space i think the more multifunctional you can make it while keeping integrity and be able to do what you want on it there are so many groups that, that aren't even informed yet that would use multi-purpose space however it is gyms courts i can think well, of like nine teams i coach right now that they take advantage of it so if there's it's there's a lot there it really comes up to how you can put the programming into it i think for, for todd and the staff to figure out community balance versus club versus school. I mean, we're talking about a, a pool that is a school, like half of that's going to be built for the school team. You know, we don't have an indoor track. We have a state championship track team. We have a state championship volleyball team that, does, you know, that, that doesn't have youth programs. So there's a lot of space in this area, I think, that we could really make very good community use out of. So much yourself. I think the a tagline that we like to use when we're going through this is we want to make the first the facility multi-purpose without making it purposeless. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we got to cardio and, and fitness. When we go ahead and we talk about cardio and fitness, this becomes it can become a contentious item. Um, just because people get concerned with the uh, potential conflict of, of going ahead and competing with the private sector. Um, one thing I will tell you is that it is going to be 10 to 15 percent of the total square footage of the building. It's a component of what you do. It's not all of what you do. 
Um, this is one of those components that's definitely, definitely going to impact membership numbers and pricing. Um, we're seeing a lot of municipalities in particular go ahead and purchase weight equipment with the idea that it's a 10-year replacement cycle and um, going more towards the concept of leasing cardio equipment. Uh, while it goes ahead and it increases your operational cost, it allows you to keep the latest, greatest equipment on your cardio floor and you don't have to worry about necessarily trying to purchase 10 new treadmills at the same time and have to make a decision with the city budget of, well, do we replace 10 treadmills or do we go ahead and buy two police cruisers? Uh, we all know how that discussion ends. So um, we're going ahead and seeing more and more functional fitness. We're going ahead and we're seeing areas of turf uh, adjacent to these spaces so people can do functional fitness, um, leaving some open space uh, so folks have an area to stretch, uh, making sure that when it comes time to lay out the cardio equipment and the weight equipment that whomever you're working with, you're talking about maximizing participation, not necessarily maximizing equipment. And what I mean by that is we've worked with some clients that have put so much equipment on their cardio floor that we've talked with members that say, yeah, if there's younger teenage men in the, or teenage boys in, in the building, I won't use that piece of equipment right over there because it's right next to an area that they use. And it's got, I'm bent over and in these weird positions. So um, again, when you start talking about the layout of weight and cardio, having some of those auxiliary spaces by and going ahead and looking at it for maximizing participation. Um, along with that is group exercise spaces. Uh, that kind of is like a pool. Do you need one big group exercise space or do you need a large and then a smaller group exercise space? Um, I, what we're seeing a lot of folks do at this point is that there's multiple spaces, one that goes ahead and can accommodate a class of 45 to 50. If the class gets bigger than that. It could always go to the gymnasium um, and then a smaller, more intimate room that could be 10 to 15 people participating. So you can really vary the size of classes that you're offering. We've already had some of those discussions at the prior committee, the, the COVID committee um, went through this and had a lot of testimony from local gym owners saying, you know, please don't come in and undercut our businesses. So we were, we're sympathetic to that. To the that. other thing that you can go oh. ahead and do, the I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt there. The other thing that you can go ahead and do is you can be very purposeful in the equipment that you put into your weight and cardio area. Um, and what I mean by that is if you look at some of the, the other providers that exist, they address that full spectrum, right? Um, there's lots of free weights. There's lots of pin select, um, those types of things. You may make a decision that says, okay, we're, we're going to do pin select equipment. We're going to do limited free weights. And maybe our dumbbell rack only goes up to 50 pounds or 75 pounds. Um, you're going ahead and you're truncating your you're still serving the population you're still going ahead and addressing that need but you're truncating the population so that some of those diehard folks that are going to go ahead and are going to use a gym um, might not necessarily look at you the other thing that we've experienced over time and, and i know you guys are sensitive to this but we might as well talk about it is that most places that we've worked that have subsequently built a recreation center a community recreation center that has fitness have seen the private sector expand their offerings, not contract. And what we attribute that to is that there is a segment of the population that is going to be willing to use a community recreation space much more so than they'd be willing to use a private gym. And the public spaces become segues and gateways into the private sector. Like an incubator. Correct. Yeah. And a lot of times it's convenience too, where I'd send my daughter to, you know, gymnastics in the gym and I'd go and get a quick workout in and I'm on the other side of the wall. I didn't have to leave the building, just maximize our family time. And didn't we've gone ahead and we've had private providers walk through a public recreation facility on a tour after it's been open. And within five minutes of them being there, they're like, this is not the market that we serve. We have the thoughts as you move forward. I'm going to teach our classes. Yeah, we talked about that also. Um, Todd just making that point of, of contracting some of the local providers to come in and teach beginners classes. Somebody who might be intimidated going to a full scale, you know, Absolutely. all out gym, and and then have them migrate after getting comfortable with the workout programs, going to one of those private facilities. Absolutely, for sure. Have you seen Have you seen a lot of these uh, fitness uh, fitness rooms and facilities in the community centers cater more towards like team training or 
therapy um, for like a local sports team that are, that needs space to do that and may not have it. So like you know cycle spin bikes or uh, uh, theraband work, uh, balance ball, all that stuff. We have seen in different markets, um, if there is a public facility like this, a coach or a, a, someone contacting and saying, "Hey, can you do a class? Can you do a spin class for my wrestlers? Can you do a a yoga class for my football players? Those types of things." We've seen some of that. Um, it, it's not uncommon to go ahead and have a physical therapy provider as a tenant. Um, and then that also becomes a gateway into additional memberships. People come in, they do their they do their therapy at the point when they're done doing their therapy, they can keep working out at the same facility, use the same equipment, see some of the same people. The next slide starts talking about support spaces. Um, support spaces can be a lot of different things. In here, you start talking about meeting room spaces, areas that can be used for uh, STEM and STEAM classes. In, in the meeting rooms, in the rentable spaces, a lot of it goes ahead and depends on the, the profitability of the spaces depends upon the finishes that you choose and the market you choose to go after. Um, some people go ahead and view those areas as cash cows and they equip them appropriately. Other folks go ahead and have a much more Spartan look to them, but they're, they're typically meeting rooms. They're not going ahead and doing a wedding or a retirement party or some of those kinds of things. So in many cases, these are on the uh, outside of the paywall, so to speak, in your facility so that you don't necessarily have to have a membership to access these types of spaces. Um, but I, again, the, the number and the variety that you include is really fluctuates based on um, the client and, and the need for it. One of the things that we do see as a as a common theme is that a room that can be broken into multiple rooms, so a sectionable space that can function as one large space that can seat 150 to 200 people, or you can go ahead and you can use two dividers that go ahead and extend from the wall or down from the ceiling, and you end up with three spaces that can go ahead and accommodate approximately 50 people each. One thing we should just add into this and as a reminder of the conversation we had with the library, which is that there's a tremendous need that they're seeing at the library that's unmet for meeting space. Um, I believe there's two meeting spaces, maybe one at 10 and one for 50 people in the library. Um, and there's just a, the demand far exceeds uh, the available space. So we see that within Scarborough that there is that tremendous need. Correct. And then the last space that we'd really gone ahead and talked about is adjacent outdoor spaces, uh, whether that is outdoor pickleball courts on the same property, whether it is extending a roof line and there is a sport court area that people can go ahead and shoot baskets or they can play uh, tag or they can go ahead and, and uh, kickball, whatever. Um, the integration of uh, playgrounds, uh, in particular, all abilities playgrounds, going ahead and creating outdoor performance spaces, um, creating, we've seen people do meditation gardens. Um, you're really only as limited as your imagination. We've even, even seen people go ahead and outside of the weight and cardio area, go ahead and extend that outside. So you've got functional training that you can do outside. Um, uh, it's at least worth going ahead and when you begin to have the conversation of what this facility is going to look like and, and what's going to be in it, but equally important, what's going to be adjacent to it as well. So one of the things, and again, we're, I, we started talking about money, we're kind of finishing talking about money, but as we go ahead and as we start talking about membership and components and those types of things, if you were looking at a gymnasium only, you're really not looking at anything that would go ahead and demand a, 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 rev, or a membership. You're probably talking about uh, daily admission fees, those types of things. Even if you went ahead and you added turf to that, um, you're probably just looking at daily fees, program fees, those types of things. As soon as you add that fitness component in, um, you go from just having daily fees to now all of a sudden you can have daily fees plus monthly fees plus annual fees, it goes ahead and it increases your membership value. Um, for some reason, people will pay a membership fee just to use a pool, uh, but will not pay the same rate as a pool plus fitness as illustrated. Or if you go 
pool plus fitness plus gym or turf, um, it really allows you to go ahead and maximize what that membership rate is. Um, and there's all, all forms of that as well, right? So you can go ahead and you can do a monthly membership. You can do some people do annual, some people do quarterly, some people will do a 10 punch pass. Um, you know, we'll go through that with you as we as we look about at this to to make sure that we're looking at a, a membership model that you think is most reflective of what your community might be interested in. Okay. Thank, thanks, Darren. And just to to round it out, um, thank you all for for staying uh, a little late. Um this is leading into uh, starting to look at this at the site, and so this this matrix here is really the, the first uh, approach to looking at some of the categories uh, and 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 scoring uh, that we would use to look at each site. You know, with each uh, with each site that we look at, we'll put together a kind of a, a data sheet uh, that gives some of the important summaries of it. You know, the location, the extents of it. Um, you know, just some images if we can get over there uh, on in person, uh, some of the you know, both quantitative and qualitative aspects of the site. Um, and then looking at each one uh, according to you know, this matrix, uh, you know, just to go through it quickly, you know, the, the importance would be, you know, we will we'll look at the interior test fit program, whether it's gen generally uh, 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 Appropriate for the size of the program they're talking about, and so you know we're we're narrowing down uh, the, the the overall size. Just make sure that the extents seem logical. Uh, and then, is there room? Would there be space left over for exterior program courts and fields, and in, in addition to the parking, et cetera, which you know has to do with wet, wetland setbacks and and zoning, et cetera. Um, Number of spaces that could be accommodated, the uh, use of the space, whether or not it's uh, it, it kind of conforms with the uh, comprehensive plan and really the the goals of that, whether it's it's intended for it, it, conservation or, or residential growth or whether it's it really seems like it's it's, it's a land for redevelopment. Um, proximate to the residential population, is it near where people are going to be coming from? Um, is it uh, approximate to transit? Is it walkable, bikeable? How do you see it fitting into the larger goals of of the of access through the community? Uh, and you know the critical uh, adjacencies, whether it's you know uh, alongside kind of some of the civic uses or or not really related at all. Uh, and then you know some of the topographic and challenges. Is it is it hilly site? Is it wetlands? Is it sloping? Is it does it let the land need to be cleared? Uh, are there existing structures on there? Um, and then, do you, are there any really off off the cuff uh, land acquisition acquisitions uh, issues that we know of? Uh, and are there any kind of special permits that would might be involved? Um, and look at these overlay districts, or or you know if there's if it's on federal land or or, or anything like that, um, or if there's any kind of federal overlay, et cetera, in the town. Some of these might might not be applicable, but you know that that's what we hope to find. Um, Keith, could I just introduce for a second? Um, please. Yep. I just want to throw this out to the committee. So we have transportation access, which is approximate the transit, walkable, bikeable, uh, parking potential. And then we have geographic location, which is described as proximate to Scarborough's residential population. So nothing specific to the, the school. town school campus, the town center campus. Do we feel that these categories, as they're written, cover what we want to have? be in the criteria related to the campus, the Scarborough High School school complex campus, or do we want to have something more specific to that adjacency? Does adjacencies cover it under what they're used to? Jason uses are likely to have some of success because as a use is more than a thing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the, the two of them kind of cover it and it, it would be weighted somewhat, but somebody can make the argument that, I don't know, Pleasant Hill area would be right before in terms of close to the center of population in town, but it's clearly not walkable to the school campus. So I just don't know how you guys feel about that criteria and do we need something more specific to the campus itself? I think we should definitely consider it. Um, I don't know if it's one category or not, but um, are, you, are you, is that what you're asking? Should yeah, I, I guess for me, I, for me, I can kind of back into it being a priority, but I could also see how somebody from away, to use a main term, would not necessarily make that same connection that I would make. 
to they the come campus. To have program function. So, we, you know, for the younger levels, we still have active care programs in the school, right? I mean, they do that. If we decide that this 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 building needs to service the fifth to twelve, that is really something for school gets out till whatever. That's a population we want to serve. Right. We have to figure it out in a way to make it accessible to them, because only a couple of those ages drive. So right. unless you're doing, you know, so we, the further we put it away, if we want to have after school programs that we want them to participate in, we have to then provide transportation to school, kids on different buses. That's a whole different piece. If you if you build the building to put all those things in there, and no one thinks no no the kids show up, it's just a dearth of wasted time or space we've built, right? So. So I think, it's, think to it me it's a big its own column. Is or, that what you're saying? Or it's a column that if you put it here, this programming is probably not something that's part of our what we do. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. if you put I, it right on the campus, you build a whole bunch of that stuff. If you put it in Pleasant Hill, maybe there's nothing from the three to five isn't as important. I mean, I don't I think the adjacency is pretty much well, we should we should Help factor it in, yeah. Which one do we factor? So those in? so those three, like the, the, the yeah, yeah, geographic transportation access and adjacencies, kind of cover it. Yeah. But you can make the argument that Pleasant Hill is post. It could be a four. Transportation access that could be similar, there. and adjacencies could be similar if it's near one of the schools, yeah. maybe. Yeah. So I mean, it's, to me, it's it might skew the weighting a little bit, but yeah, I, I leave it. I leave it. Do you think it would be better just to have? Uh, it's related to the school, like, do you think it should have its own column? If you put in its own column, then it won't factor into what we score the other three columns it, at all, right? Yeah, it would just right. be, oh, by the way, so, it's either here or there, and then, right. we, yeah, we, we the programming needs the applicable or not applicable. So, academic interface or something, yeah, yeah I, I mean, might suggest um, that we maybe rename the geographic location or the description. It shouldn't be only residential population. We might want to call it target population because we've also talked about in some of our earlier meetings that there are folks who are um, coming to Scarborough to work and might use this community center before work or after work as a resource and potential membership. Um, and so we want to take into account where people are, uh, where the target population is during the course of the day, during the course of the week. And I think that that would also weigh in terms of Proximity, proximity to schools or proximity to senior living centers um, and also proximity to residential neighborhoods. And I think you know we'll have some flexibility as we look at this um, at each of these sites and we'll collectively kind of score them. Yeah. Okay, I think that would satisfy my question. Yeah. And again, to be able to just differentiate, and I think you guys have already figured it out, like in my mind, I wouldn't score a lot near Pleasant Hill, the same ranking I would score a lot near the target, the these three schools, you know what I mean? Because right. then you're gonna have a bigger population, you know. So to your point, I think this that change will give us that flexibility yeah. to rank it. No, I agree. It's 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 a subtle nuance, but it does make a difference, I think, That's to me. Because we could identify a huge place with lots of cheap wind. We can have outdoor fields and all the stuff oh, around it. And you put it out running Hill Road, and right. you know you know, no one's driving over there, you know. But they might, but you put a smaller thing right here, and it's going to be triple the amount of usage. Yeah. Well, and to keep and to Brett's point too, and we haven't had a lot of conversation about it. We'll have to let them lean lean on them a little more. But that workforce is a huge membership potential because when you, if, if we go north, you can talk about the bath YMC. If we go that way, they have a huge lunchtime with BRW and all those places that work. Huge eleven to one population of people that are on their breaks, getting off a shift. Uh, that go and lift or hit the pool or, or play basketball leagues. That's a demographic that, you know, is a high revenue maker for that type of facility. So just a consideration when we talk about models, which leverages kind of the tech district from Pegas to, you know, anything in yeah. the middle is close to most of the workable stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. First, that's All right. The visit thing? Are we? I think we got through their stuff. Just are we through your stuff? No, we're not. No, nope. we? just next steps. We'll uh, we'll you know, put these all together, and we'll uh, probably color code them so we can easily take a snapshot and do some some leveling, et cetera. Um, but then just the next steps, we're going to be look at the the starting to identify the program, uh, really start really get us start looking at sites starting on on the twentieth, and uh, we'll we'll uh, refine our community engagement plan uh, for our meeting on the seventh uh, on on the twentieth when we get together next time. 
So would this be your uh, agenda for Patrick to approve? Uh, again, all the ancillary approving amendments of stuff that we're thinking, Keith? Or do you want to send us an agenda item? Think about it a little more and then get back to us. Yeah, let me get back to you. But yeah, I think you know this is broadly what we're trying to accomplish. Cool. And you know, I think you know you and I talked on offline and and things have come up and we've we've made some tweaks and whatnot. But yeah, I think this is generally what we're trying to go for. Yeah. So so you what you know, Glenn, is that yeah. we agreed a couple of meetings ago that now that we're fully invested in their their plan, then they will send us agenda items, we'll get them to Patrick as the chair, and then. He'll approve them for the agenda. Just that way, we're staying on their schedule. So, just so you know, that's what yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the community engagement meetings because I was unclear about yeah. the dates and um, times. So, so the, just so I can get it on yeah. my calendar. So December seventh is the only one we've confirmed. Yeah. And that's the one that there's some things going on during the day. Yeah. So we'll be at the schools from eleven to one. Okay. And then we'll um, and, and the after school one we were talking about with the seniors like a two or three thirty, but I'll confirm those with Keith and their schedule. But that's kind of what we leave. So de on. December seventh. I just want to block my calendar off to ten yeah. if I can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then so, so the twentieth is still the evening meeting. That's still our meeting. Yeah, right. Just yeah. okay. I had all right. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, January would be the public engagement one. Yeah, after you have to set that date still. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we'll add to this agenda, this tentative agenda uh, setting the rest of our meeting dates at the next at the next meeting. We will talk about our our final second half, I guess, if you will, uh, meeting dates. Um, two other quick things we just wanted to touch on. Um, I wanted to give uh, Pod an opportunity to give you guys some feedback about the uh, election day table that they had set up on Tuesday at Town Hall. And then I want to talk about tour dates, but why don't you talk about the election? Yeah, so staff, we posted at the election table. Um, uh, we didn't have hundreds of people come to the table asking about stuff, but the people that did come had a lot of good questions. Um, it was an opportunity to just really expressed to people. And I met with every staff before they went to the table to explain to them, people ask about this, nothing is designed, nothing is set. There's not a dollar figure, there's not a location. This day is about their opportunity to come tell us what you want to see in a building. And so they really try to push that message because this is a citizen choice. And if it's not their choice, then it's never gonna pass whenever it does make it to a ballot. Um, and so, Again, with a facility, you can have all the programming space you want, but if it's not designed to Karen's point, my old facility, when we um, started talking about budgetary cuts, we cut away storage and it was an absolute nightmare. We had stuff stuffed everywhere, we ruined equipment. And so um, knowing what people want in the building is really important for a healthy operation to be able to manage and maintain it. So we got some really good feedback on that piece. And so, um, I look forward to the activity of charrettes and just every opportunity we get because it's just nice to hear what people want to see. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you could maybe collect the total point notes you had from the feedback you got on yep. election day and yep. we'll include it in our data points yep. um, from, the, from the information that we get from the charrettes um, just yep. so we have everything available to everybody else. Um, so we did a poll for the tour dates and it was pretty much even. So we had the December 9th. December 16th and January 13th were the three days that we threw out to everybody that we had discussed that were, were generally available to most of us. Um, so nine people said the 9th would work, eight people said the 16th would work, and eight people said the 13th would work. <laughs> so I, I, I'm gravitating towards December 9th um, to try to, and, and knowing that we're only going to be able to do either a north tour or a south tour. So we can do the facilities kind of like a, within an hour or so north drive of us. Um, in one in one half day session, um, if we wanted to try to set something up on a southern tour, maybe Dover or something like that, we could try to hit some of those facilities. Um, we might want to do a second day. So what's the what's the feedback of the group? So December 9th, I think was an obvious one, maybe to try to have God start that's setting Saturday, some of those. Right? Yeah, yeah. Saturday. We're talking about in the morning, so it would be 10. Um, okay. but I can't do it in the afternoon. Um so do you think it, I mean, if we could hit a lot of them in the morning. Yeah, the, the, the facilities, just so you know, that we kind of plan, I was going up the coast towards where I live is, I'm very familiar with those facilities and yeah. those directors, but you've got the Bath YMCA, who's got a legitimate competition pool. You can look over, you know, raised seating. They've got a small rec pool, separate kind of glass therapy pool. And then they have a lot of the functions that have been listed here, walking track, multi-meeting room. Uh, there was Cassett. What I used to manage has got the pool that has the shared space with some spray features. Uh, and then the Booth Bay YMCA, which is about 15 minutes away, they just built a new pool, which is 
what Darren was describing was a typical six lane pool, shared space, but then a second body of water that was really a zero entry. Um, I'm sorry, it was a therapy pool, but it was still about two feet deep in one end. Um, and that's a facility that what I liked about when you're talking with their manager and past tours is that that facility has been expanded upon over and over and over. And so they've gotten to a point for a reason. So hearing some of that stuff from the building manager is really important, I think, for you guys to hear because, you know, like Darren said, you're not building another pool once you build it. You know, my old building had one gym and then we had a wall. We never built a second gym, um, but it was designed to be able to accompany it. So to me, we've got a great architects, great consultants. I love hearing from building operations because they're the ones that have to take care of it after. And where are the pinch points and just, hey, if I could do this, put a custodial closet in every room. I'm not lugging mop buckets. I mean, just those type of functional things are really good to hear, um, which make a huge, you know, uh, effect down the road and you're not adding closet space to stuff. So, so those three Patrick, facilities. Is, is Saturday yeah. the only option? Those are the dates that we threw out. I have January 13th, is that a Saturday? Also? Yeah, well, you, when you asked me to it's put the Martin. poll out, it was just Saturdays. And What's I up? skipped it. I think it's Martin the 13th. The 13th is. Yeah. I work for a tax firm. We don't get holidays from January to the middle of April. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is Martin Luther King. Yeah, I mean, I just, is it, is there a day other than a Saturday that we could get greater participation or are we really happy with eight to 10 people? Well, I was wondering if we might be able to set up like something more local. Hey, anyone that can make it on Thursday, we set up a tour at Salt you know, something like right around here. Yeah, like to get some local Elizabeth ones. Because I don't want us all yeah. on our own and be like, hey, can, I'm going to can yeah. you show me around? Like, oh, you're co right. you No, I don't want to do that. But if we're going to go further away, for me, I, I can't really skate out of work. So Saturday has to come to Saturday. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think we can do that. I would suggest so everybody can get a feel. Like, if we can pick a Saturday to try to hit some of these ones that have the distinct features, I know the pools here do not have those features. Thank you. You know, talking, you can see the cave. They've got a nice blocked L yeah. um, cement bleachers. Um, we've had a lot of competitions in that pool. Um, and then, you know, the South Portland pool, their deck is troubled. It's not a lot of deck space. They're stuck on the end. So, like, being able to see those, we could set up a, a weeknight and say, hey, yeah. Yeah. let's take a meeting night and go to these and be at three of them in an hour. Yeah. Well, so, I, mean, like, okay. I just know they have different features. Like, I don't yeah. know what Cape has outside of the pool, but, like, South Portland is a massive field house built around in that building, yeah. you know. For lots of other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's, so let's, if, we, if, for me. if, if, if December or, 9th, sorry, 9th, December 9th, yeah. let's, let's have the, the bath was passed at Booth Bay yeah. in the morning that day. And if you think, how early do people want to launch? Most of these buildings open up at eight o'clock. I mean, so we're, uh, that's earlier the better. Well, earlier the better. Yeah. Let's get, <laughs> let's get <laughs> earlier the better. Every day. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. me too. Yeah. For me, yeah, it's, yeah. it's just a matter of five. Yeah. We can go early, but I won't. So let me put a plan together with a ninth. I'll talk to the facilities director and I'll lay out a time frame to be able to share with you. And I'll do that prior to the next meeting. Okay. Thanks guys for coming. Um, mm -hmm. prior to the next meeting, so you can see it better be like, because again, if you talked about three facilities and maybe an hour each one, yeah. an hour back if we talked about a five hour from the five hour. Yeah, so, yeah. so if we can still a lot of hours. We can there. leave at seven, be there at eight. They're not next yeah. to each other. Oh wow. Yeah, there is still a little space between us. Yeah, they're you know about <laughs> like 20 minutes between each other. You don't have to talk either. Yeah. <laughs> I might just stay up then. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a, about one a.m. two a.m. go to bed person. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh okay, so we'll do that. And then I don't I don't want to take off the table the possibility about going having a maybe second. a second one where yeah. we hit some other facilities maybe to the south um also because yeah. i know there are yeah, some I good facilities the nine. i'll see it being marie okay okay it doesn't matter yeah. 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 and the one that in the facilities in the south i will say are are newer and more refined as far as they've been built to which different things so that would probably be a good second for us we wanted to do, do you guys want to try to set that up now another day now I mean, everybody, I mean, eight, eight of us could go. I mean, there's only, there's only eight of us here right now. That's most of the group still. Yeah, do we want to talk next? I mean, do we want to look at what after the first tour? I'm just worried that that gives us enough time to plan because that's only that's the next weekend. And then the other one is a month later. Yeah, or, or we look further into January. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, okay. like, like so the, let's do the first one and then see what the temperature of the committee is. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah, yeah. 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 okay. Yeah, not so, so the ninth, so the ninth, Todd will work on the ninth, do a 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. 
kind of deal. So maybe put that as a placeholder on your calendar, please. So yeah. Saturday, December 9th, 7 a.m. 7 a. to 1 p.m. Thanks. And do, we, do we have anything? So I know we kind of went for next steps, but is there anything specifically that we want to, that we need to look at or go over as, a, you know, for the next meeting? Like, I, we got a lot of this stuff coming out. If I didn't know if it was yeah. like, Keith, hey, for the next meeting, for us, please read this. Because I just, it might not be ready yet. It's just good to know. Um, you know, I think a lot of our, dis I think a lot of the decisions will come from, you know, test fitting, et cetera. I think we got good feedback on, uh, on the site scoring matrix. Um, I, I think, uh, Tom and Todd have some homework in terms of starting to dish us sites. Um, Brett. Thank you, muted, Brett. Can you hear me? And now, maybe your boom, maybe your mic's not down on all right. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I will give you a little bit of homework. You're both our advisors and our ambassadors for this project. Um, so to the extent that you can talk to your friends and your neighbors, fellow residents, about all of the programs we're considering and what they're looking for as well, that's going to be incredibly helpful for us moving forward. And what I'll do to you guys is, again, Jill's going to work on the beginning of next week, uh, Facebook event, well, doctor and up a little more flyer once we can kind of finalize those term, those exact time frames. I can send those to links and stuff too. Send them to your friends. The more people we can get to that seven is really important. And then if they can't be able to let you, hey, let me know your comments. And if you guys, we can talk a little more, but like um, how you want to receive that feedback from people. And we can get it. If somebody sends you an email, you can send it to me and we can catalog it or something and get it to them to be able to catalog in their data that they're going to collect. We'll click a mailing plan if we lose the type idea, like just drop in and give us give us the feedback and some of the recorded. Yeah, yeah, so it'll be kind of sections where you can just put stuff on the wall, okay. ask questions, kind of really just you can stop and go is totally low key. So you don't have to be there for two hours. So cool. Great. Cool. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you guys. Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Some Second. 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 All in favor? <laughs> Thank you all for staying late. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night, Keith, thank Brad. You. Thank you. See ya. See you, Liz. Bye -bye. We are still recording. I still haven't, uh, can't get to the stop button. Hang on. That's, there we go. Just so it's. <laughs>